the third and the final part of our brief foray into uh, the world of compilers and in this particular one of the process of, of optimization uh, within the compilation process. This is an important one because uh, you know, the process of, of, of trying to optimize our code is something that's going to help us as programmers to, to have something that runs as fast or as, as small as it can be. So we do want to spend a little bit of time looking at a very high level about how the compiler actually uh, goes about optimizing code and the types of things that we can then do as programmers to, uh, to aid it in doing this process. So we're all pointing out that you could arguably do an entire module, more than an entire module, just simply looking at different types and forms of, of optimization, of code optimization that could be applied. And indeed, some people spend their whole career researching this. And so this is very much a high level scratch of the, the surface. Uh, just to, to, by way of setting the scenes, I mean, this fundamentally ties into the notion of uh, efficiency. We want to make our program efficient. And if we're talking about making it efficient, of optimizing it, you need to say, in what regard? What are you trying to, to optimize? Uh, there's two main uh, elements you may try to optimize or to make as efficient as you can be uh, if we're thinking about programs. One of them is the amount of memory, the memory footprint that is required to run that program. And the second one then is the number of CPU cycles that are required to execute that program. And if you're developing for a, a device that has a limited amount of, of memory, then you may want to optimize to make the memory footprint as small as possible. Uh, if memory isn't a concern, then you probably want to optimize to make it run as fast as it possibly can to require as few CPU instructions. That can make it more responsive. We've also mentioned before, it can also help by way of, of putting less drain on the, the device. Important if you're having something that's running um, uh, from a, a battery or some other type of uh, supply of power. When we um, think about the process of optimization, it is uh, in principle true to say that for one particular problem, there will be one optimal or the most optimal uh, solution, or it could be shared with a number of them, but there'll be a one approach beyond which you'll not be able to do faster. Now you might think that for the compiler, the process of compilation, can we actually get that optimal, the most optimal um, uh, program out from whatever we put in? Turns out that that isn't really uh, realistic and it ties into to how and all the different ways you could reconstruct a program so that it has functionally the same output, um, but maybe structured differently, which can tie into memory, tie into performance. Um, so it's an MP complete program, which means there is, as you increase the complexity of the program, the number of different ways you can restructure it vastly increases. So it isn't um, at the minute uh, nowadays or for the foreseeable future possible to simply do a, a, a blunt um, analysis of every single possible way you could implement this to have the same output but structured in different ways. Um, can't simply do that. Now what does that mean as a consequence? It means then that when we're thinking about an optimizer within a compiler, how does it do its job? There's two broad approaches. One is the use of, uh, you can see down here, heuristics. Heuristics are rules of thumb which say that you know, if you see this or if you find yourself in this situation, it's a good idea to do that. Strictly speaking, it's normally a good idea to do that. So heuristic, a rule of thumb, are guidance, guidelines about the types of changes that are likely to be beneficial, uh, in this case, in optimizing our program. The second one is case-based algorithms. And they say that if you see X, Y, or Z, then you should do A, B, and C, because A, B, and C are known to be beneficial if you see X, Y, and Z. So that's how an optimizer at a high level works. It looks at the code that we write. It tries to map it onto a number of cases that it knows. It tries to apply heuristics to the code that it sees. And it uses those then to produce a more, one hopes, more optimal uh, version of our program. And a good uh, optimizer will produce one that is maybe nearly optimal in that sense. This is important. It's important for us as programmers because the optimizer will be trying to compare our code against templates that it's looking for. Because our optimizer will be trying to use rules of thumbs, heuristics. If we write our code in a way that 
maps easily onto it or makes it visible or explicit uh, the types of assumptions it's looking for, then we give it the hooks, the ability for the optimizer to notionally understand the code that we've written. If we write our code in a different way where that's not as apparent, then it makes the job of the optimizer uh, more difficult. And if it's too difficult, then the optimizer is not going to be able to optimize our code and we end up with a program that will not be as fast, as efficient as it might otherwise um, have been. In terms of how the optimizer goes about doing this, we there's really one sort of simple notion we want to look at, the notion of a block of code or of a basic block of code. Um, in essence, optimizers work by sort of analyzing flows of data through a program. So it's interested in taking, for example, a variable or a piece of data and looking at how that variable or piece of data may potentially be modified or manipulated or changed as it passes through a number of different instructions. Um, because that, that functionally is, is the process that happens. And that means you may be able to rearrange those instructions to have the same functional um, output, but to do it in a faster, more efficient, more memory uh, compacted manner. So data flow analysis is, is at the heart of what we're talking about here. Um, now you mentioned the middle paragraph, the optimizer may not be able to track variables within poorly written code. So if, if it's trying to understand the flow of data through it, then depending on how we've written it, that will determine the challenge that it actually faces overall. When we're thinking about a basic block, as we are here, this is a chunk of code into which there is one exit point and one exit point. So you enter in, you will go through a list of instructions, one after the other, and you will exit out the end. That's known as a basic block. There's no opportunity or notion of jumping or transitioning out of that block midway through. So I'll give you an example um, in this uh, uh, piece of, of, of the slide here. So you have 18 lines of, of code. That doesn't really matter what it does. It's only a, uh, an illustration. Um, so again, basic block ends where there is a jump in or out of the, the flow of control. So we have a look at this. Lines 1 goes on to line 2, on to line 3, on to line 4. So that's a block of code that when you enter line 1, you're going to go straight through to line 4. At line 5, we've got an if statement. So this is where it isn't a linear flow of control. We have a decision point. It can go one way or it can go the other way. Uh, so that's where that first initial block ends. So we have a second block of code, which is line 7 and 8, if the if condition is true. And block 3, uh, lines 12 to 15, where the if is false, where the else condition then triggers. And then down to line 17 and 18, we have block 4 coming in after the two. Now, if we're thinking about this here, um, and the notion of data flow, of tracking a variable, so for example, quotient, uh, so at line two is set equal to five. And we want to, at the end of this fragment of code, to understand, is quotient still going to be five? How might it have changed? Uh, and, and depending on what value it has, how it might change, we may then be able to use that in terms of optimizing it. So this is where the notion of splits, where if you have an if statement, um, depending on which path you take down, that may or may not change the, the variable you're looking at. If it does change it, so for example, in this case, quotient is something that is updated in both the if and in the else, it means down in line 17, where we're trying to store the quotient, we actually have two different variables that it could be, depending on which side of the if else it went down. Now, Tracking two different variables to say is either going to be this or going to be that, that's not difficult for a compiler. If there was three different variables, it could be A, B, or C, or so three different values that a variable could have, or if you had multiple variables, that's where it gets more interesting. And all optimizers will have a limit just in terms of how many different values for a variable they can track, or how many different variables they can track in terms of going through this. And then that ties into the structure of the code. So depending on how we write it, um, we either will present it with a, a difficult uh, flow analysis or a more straightforward flow analysis. There's a simple rule of thumb here. Uh, and if we use this rule of thumb, yeah, it's a heuristic, we will be helping the optimizer to do its job. And you see it down at the bottom, good rule of thumb. 
Avoid unnecessarily, and that's the key word, unnecessarily complex branching. So branch only when we need to. If you don't need to branch, then don't branch. So if you try when writing your code to avoid unnecessary branches, then that is the type of thing that's going to help the optimizer and, and make it much more, well, one presumes, much more likely that it'll be able to track the flow of data through the program and hence then to be able to apply its, its rules of thumbs, its own heuristics, its own case-based uh, analysis. As an illustration of, um, and this is very high level, some of the types of things that, that an optimizer might do. So this is sort of to flavor then that it's understood our code, it's sort of tracked the things through, and it's been able to do that, it hasn't had to give up in that process, then what might it do as a consequence? So just go through these quite quickly. Constant folding is the first one. So compute and use the value of a constant expression or sub-expression at compile time instead of emitting code. So whenever you are compiling it or optimizing it and you realize that this variable always has a fixed constant value, then in terms of the actual uh, code that gets to be emitted, the instructions that get to be written out, don't put in a variable, which requires you then to go to that piece of memory to check out the value of that piece of memory and to use it. Just hard code in notionally the actual value itself that would have been looked up from it. So that'll give us a, an efficiency saving. Constant propagation is another one. So if a variable is assigned a constant value, it doesn't change, then replace that variable with the constant value. So again, you, you the same sort of thing of putting that particular thing in. Sub-expression elimination, you can see this over here. Um, so we have um, over on the left-hand side, well, a is equal to b times c plus x is line 1. And a line 2, d is equal to b times c plus y. So in doing this, we have a b times c is a common um, sub-expression. So you could, if you wanted to, admit the instructions to take b to multiply it by c and to store it in some temporary variable. Um, or you could restructure the code. So you do that initially at line 1, you compute b times c. And then lines 2 and 3, when you're calculating a and d, you make use of that um, value that's been uh, created. So when they talk about sub-expression elimination, it's, it's, it's not really deleting the thing, it's simply doing it up front and making use then of that data and not recomputing exactly the same uh, value. A few other things, dead code elimination. Uh, so ideally, we shouldn't put these in as developers anyway when we're writing it. But removal of statements, when well, neither the result of the statement will never be used. That's known as irrelevant code. So you, you've written something, you, you give something a value or calculate something, but you then never actually use that thing later on. Relevant. Or when a conditional block containing the statement will never be triggered. And, and sometimes that can be a little bit more hard to discern. Um, known as dead code. So if an if condition can never ever be true, there's no point omitting instructions for that. It's just going to waste memory. Uh, loop invariance, a similar sub expression elimination that if whenever you're looking at a looping structure, a for, a while, or whatever it's going to be, there is some computation that's calculated within that loop that is invariant. So every single time you go through the loop, you will calculate the same thing again and again and again. That's just wasteful computation. So um, you can do the thing initially at the start and then reuse it as you go through. Um, we're all saying there when we're talking about the different ways you can optimize, we have the notion of, of CPU cycles or memory usage. There was a comment in the slide that indicated that generally speaking, you can't do both. Um, you can try to balance them if you want to, but often a lot of the techniques that aim to improve the, the, the speed at which it executes will do so by creating more or using more memory, for example, for holding temporary variables that otherwise wouldn't exist. And likewise, if you're trying to optimize the memory, some of the techniques there will do that by recalculating things as opposed to storing them in memory. So quite often these two things are, are not mutually exclusive, but the techniques to enhance one have a detrimental effect on the, the other. Um, induction, similar thing there. So a loop, if a variable is, is a computer expression, maybe entirely dependent upon another variable, you, you can use a mathematical process, induction, to, to sort of infer, to calculate that, to merge these things together so you have a more simple form of the expression. Uh, strength reduction is an interesting one. So if we have a look at the fragment of code at the top, we've got a 4, 
um, I0 going up to n, exactly the same in the, the loop structure in the bottom. So we're going to calculate exactly the same value. What we're storing here is updating an array with index i, and we're setting it equal to 2 times i. Now, the whole notion of 2 times i, 2 times 0, 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 2 times 4, effectively it's just adding the variable onto itself every single time. Um, so there, that calculation or series of multiplications is the same as a series of additions where you know you're adding the value 2 onto the addition every time. Because you think about the series would go 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and so on. You can multiply that out, you can just add that up 2 at a time. Um, now, compilers are capable of working that out and they're capable then of going, right, I have a multiplication instruction to execute here. And if I can replace that with a um, a less strong, sort of a weaker instruction, like an addition, something that's quicker to calculate, you can have the same overall answer, but you can use a bunch of instructions that do it in a way that is faster. So, for example, in this case, in the bottom, if we introduce in this, this variable int uh, called temp, and um, instead of lines, uh, or line three in the top, we were doing a multiplication, in line four, we're simply doing an assignment and an addition. That's going to execute a little bit quicker than the multiplication one at the top. But depending on the number of iterations through the, the loop, that can be quite a significant um, saving. Um, so other examples there, if you're doing multiplication or division or things like that, if the things you're multiplying with uh, is, is a 2, a 4, a 16, something like that, a par a 2, then you can also use bit shifting, just simply to shift the bits uh, one way or the other if the number has the same overall effect. Um, most compilers, uh, they're, they're set up, they, well, it depends on the settings you set up for it, but you can probably assume initially no optimizations will be applied unless we actually tell it how we want the thing uh, to be optimized. And if we're telling it, we'll normally be expressing a preference for, for speed or for memory in terms of which thing we want to, uh, to try to have as much efficiency in as possible. Bit of the bottom is relevant. Uh, many debuggers won't work with optimized code. So if you're debugging your program and running in debug mode, there you have additional code put in that has breakpoints and a whole bunch of other stuff. That's almost, you know, it, it slows down the program. So that's why you do use debug mode to, to have all of this functionality available. Whenever you're happy, turn into release mode, removes that, but therein you also apply whatever form of optimization you want to, to do. And for good measure, you make sure you thoroughly test the program in release mode as well. Uh, key takeaways. To best exploit the optimizing abilities of your compiler, which we want to do, you should write code in a compiler-friendly manner. That makes sense. There, we're doing something to help the compiler because it will then ultimately help us. We stand to benefit. How do you do this? Well, you can get into a lot of different things, but a simple rule of thumb is to avoid writing unnecessarily complex code. Don't branch and have jumps going left, right, and center. Just write it as simple as the thing can be, and in doing that, you'll probably help the optimizer understand what you have written.